Good evening and welcome to an entire seminar hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, welcome to uh, the audience that's present right now. And also if you're watching this as a recording um, on YouTube or on our Facebook channel, welcome to the series. Uh, tonight's guest is Professor Mark Soames, um, who is the professor of neuro, oh, sorry, is the director of neuropsychology at the Neuroscience Institute of the University of Cape Town. And he's also an honorary lecturer in neurosurgery at the St. Ba Bartholomew's and Royal London Hospital School of Medicine. He has many other accolades to his name. Um, I, I first encountered Mark Soames's work uh, through reading an article in the local uh, Sunday Times newspaper um, in which it uh, talked about his, his book that had come out in 2021, The Hidden Spring, uh, which goes into the source of consciousness. Um, and I read this as part of my research, um, as part of my humor role into artificial intelligence and part of wider reading into consciousness and the philosophical issues around, around consciousness. Um, so I, after reading this article about Marx's work, I went to the UCT library and took out the hidden spring and really enjoyed it and uh, contacted Mark and we started a conversation uh, about the work that uh, he was doing in this book. So just to give my own very crude uh, version of what it, of what it is, it's, uh, it has to do with locating consciousness in uh, feelings rather than necessarily the intellect, the intellect or the intellectual parts of the brain. I relate it to the work we are doing with artificial intelligence to distinguish between the idea of an artificial consciousness, which Mark proposes is possible to, to make, um, which wouldn't necessarily be an artificial intelligence. It doesn't have to be um, you know, a, a intelligent artificial construct, um, but it could have self-awareness through working with affect and emotion. Um, the Hidden Spring is also quite autobiographical and Mark traces his, what has led him into this field from childhood. Um, and one of the issues that Mark touches on is that he works in two camps that are often um, in, in, in tension with one another in psychology in terms of being a neuroscientist and a psychoanalyst. And the neuroscience being very focused on an objective understanding of the brain and uh, psychoanalysis being concerned with subjective reportings of, um, of your brain or your, or your mind. Um, and Mark practices in both spheres and is quite unusual in that and has uh, promoted that, that intersection. So with that very brief introduction to, to Mark, uh, Mark is going to give what he's described as the shortest presentation on the most complex <laughs> subject. Uh, so Mark is going to give a presentation of about half an hour uh, looking at his work and uh, we are going to then have um, an open discussion afterwards in which I know people are interested in asking questions and engaging with Mark on his work. So Mark, I know you're going to share a presentation and yeah, please take it from here. Thanks, Ralph. Um, here comes my presentation. and yeah, my little pointer. Um, so can you see my screen? Uh, yes, you can see your screen fine. Great, great. So um, as Ralph just told you, this is my topic. Um, I'm going to introduce um, a project currently underway at the University of Cape Town, um, uh, together with a few physicists and uh, computer scientists and roboticists, um, also some of them from abroad, uh, where, we are, where we are trying to develop an artificial consciousness. Uh, I really don't have time to go into this project in any detail. I'm going to focus on the sort of foundations of it, the background to it and the foundations of it, and then uh, uh, hopefully uh, any particular technical questions that may interest anyone uh, can come up in the discussion. Uh, so uh, we start with this um, paper by Tom Nagel, a philosopher, um, in which uh, he says that we can have no idea what it is like to be a bat. A uh, bat has a, 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 a perceptual system for echolocation, 
we don't have such a perceptual system, so we can have no idea uh, what it is like to experience echolocation. Um, and on the basis of this, he makes the more general point uh, that we can know everything there is to know about bat brains uh, using objective physical methods, uh, but it will never tell us anything about what it is like to be a bat. And this what it is like is what consciousness is all about. And therefore, it seems physical science uh, can't, um, can't, uh, can't cope with this problem of, of subjective experience. Um, here is the question that arises from his work. I am not reading you what he wrote there because there's no time. This is the summary. He basically says, why and how is there something it is like to be an organism? Something it's like for the organism. Why and how does this happen? Um, well, that was in the 70s, 1970s. Um, I remember being absolutely fascinated by this paper uh, when I was a student. And uh, then, you know, the work was taken up uh, in neuroscience. Uh, we started trying to, under, trying to understand what the physical basis of consciousness is, notwithstanding uh, what Nagel had said uh, when he said it was impossible. Um, and uh, the, 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 the leading uh, figure uh, in that, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, particularly uh, by the mid 1990s, uh, was Francis Crick. Um, and he basically said, "Look, let's just let's just approach the problem uh, uh, as we would anything else, uh, and let's take one example of consciousness. Let's take conscious vision. Uh, we know a lot about the brain mechanisms of vision. Here's the visual cortex of the macaque monkey." pretty similar to the visual cortex of the human brain. And you know, let's try and understand what all these little bits and bobs are doing. Um, and uh, we know, as I said, quite a lot uh, about the, the, the uh, information processing that goes on uh, in the visual cortex. And uh, this is the neural correlate of visual consciousness. And uh, if we can drill down in this way, eventually we'll find what the physical mechanism is, whereby visual consciousness arises. There's a lot of visual information processing that goes on unconsciously um, and a lot that goes on consciously. All we need to do is find the difference between what's going on in the brain when visual processing is unconscious, what's going on when it's conscious, and then we will have identified what he called the neural correlate of consciousness. Uh, the philosopher David Chalmers made much of the fact that uh, this finding of a correlate of consciousness uh, will never tell us anything about how that correlate, how, how and why uh, that correlate turns into an actual visual experience. Uh, again, he uses this phrase that, that Tom Nagel used, that it, it, there is something it is like to have visual experience. Um, and understanding uh, the visual correlates, uh, even to the, the, I mean, the, the neural correlates, even to the degree of detail that I just showed you in that information flow chart, uh, that Feldman and Panessin uh, drew up for our understanding of visual information processing in the, in, in the cortex, uh, will we'll ne we'll never tell us how that information and why that information processing turns into a visual experience, uh, something like the quality of deep blue. Um, he said that, our, this is Chalmers speaking, uh, he said that our normal approach um, in neuroscience uh, is to try to try to identify the functional mechanism, the functional mechanism whereby visual information is processed. Uh, and he says this, this usual method doesn't work when it comes to the hard problem of consciousness. It's easy to correlate, uh, to find neural correlates of the subjective experiences, but the hard problem is to explain how and why do those neural processes turn into visual experiences. I must emphasize, it's not just how, it's also why, because um, uh, uh, Chalmers makes the point that, that, that in fact was one of the starting points of Crick's work, which is that a hell of a lot of visual information processing goes on unconsciously. So the question is, why does it ever go on consciously? Um, and uh, this point is illustrated by uh, another philosopher called Frank Jackson, uh, who, who, who coined what's now known as the knowledge argument. He says, and I'm going to simplify the argument, he says, imagine a visual neuroscientist named Mary. 
who knows everything that there is to know about the physical uh, uh, and physiological and information processing functional mechanisms um, of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, vision uh, in the human cortex. Uh, but Mary is blind. So even though she knows all of this stuff, um, she has never herself experienced vision. So she can't know what the quality of blue is like uh, because the quality of blue is not explained. The quality of red, the quality of any visual experience is not explained by her, her knowledge of the functional mechanisms, the physical, physiological, and functional information processing mechanisms of vision. And if one day, thanks be to God, she's gifted with sight, she will learn something utterly new about vision that she never knew before. So all of that knowledge of the physical and functional mechanisms of visual information processing doesn't tell us one thing about visual experience, about why it occurs uh, and about how it occurs. And so that is the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, so just to state that very plainly, uh, Chalmers says, why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? Uh, I would add, and how? And why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any field? That is the hard problem. So keep it clearly in your minds uh, as we now proceed uh, to address the problem. Um, I have to say, I have some sympathy with Chalmers's argument and with Jackson's argument and with Nagel's argument. Um, the, 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 it is true uh, that cortical visual information processing can go on unconsciously. Um, you can read unconsciously. You can recognize faces unconsciously. In fact, you can even discriminate colors unconsciously. These are all cortical processes. Uh, when it comes to, to, to reading, they're uniquely human cortical processes. So these are very high level cortical processes, and yet they can go on uh, I wouldn't say perfectly, but certainly adequately without consciousness being there at all. So the question remains, why and how do we, do we become conscious of all of this? What's the point of it becoming conscious and how on earth does it become conscious? And it's not clear what the consciousness is doing because the cortex can do all of this visual information processing without consciousness. So that's the background. I say I have some sympathy with that view. Um, I uh, want to emphasize that we've been talking about visual cortex, um, and I think that the problem that we face, the problem that leads me to have some sympathy with the views of Thomas and, and, and his ilk, uh, is precisely the problem that I've just mentioned, that visual cortical information processing is not intrinsically conscious. So th there's a real problem with Crick's uh, approach. Crick saying, well, let's try and understand what's going on in the visual cortex when we're conscious, um, and then we will have identified the neural correlate of consciousness, and then we can generalize from there. I think that's not a good place to, uh, to look for a model example of consciousness, because visual information processing, as I've just said repeatedly, in fact, uh, is not intrinsically conscious. So why look to processes which are not intrinsically conscious? We have long known since the late 1940s, that the cortex is not intrinsically conscious in totality. It's not just the visual cortex, the whole of the cortex um, is only rendered conscious by being activated by structures in the brain stem. The source of consciousness uh, in the human brain and in every brain that we know uh, is in the brain stem. Uh, so these purple structures here in the brain stem are known collectively as the reticular activating system, and cortical processes are not intrinsically conscious unless they are activated by the reticular activating system. So, for example, the reticular activating system makes you go to sleep at night. It turns consciousness off, uh, and it makes you wake up in the morning. It turns consciousness on. Uh, so if this is where the source of consciousness is, why, 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 why have we been looking there? Why haven't we been looking down here? Uh, so that's my the, one of my two main arguments is we've been looking in the wrong place. Uh, we should have been looking at these structures, the essential function of which is to render us conscious, uh, including to render the cortex conscious. So the cortex processes information unconsciously unless uh, and to only to the degree 
that it is activated, that its activity is modulated by these brainstem nuclei known as the reticular activating system. So I'm saying we should look down there. If the cortex were really the seat of consciousness, there's a very simple uh, experiment uh, that should, that should uh, uh, you should be able to uh, falsify this prediction. Uh, the prediction is if you remove cortex, then there should be no consciousness. That's what should happen if the cortex is the seat of consciousness. Um, and uh, if consciousness persists, once the cortex has been removed, then you falsified the hypothesis that the cortex is the seat of consciousness. And that's easily demonstrated. Here's a child, three years old, who has absolutely no cortex. Here you can see she's got a perfectly intact brain stem, but she's got no cortex. This is a condition known as hydranencephaly. Uh, now, uh, as I said, uh, if the cortex was the seat of consciousness, this child should be in a coma. So here she is, here she is. Uh, as you can see, she's conscious. That means she wakes up in the morning and she goes to sleep at night. But I want to show you something even more interesting than that. So that falsifies, the already falsifies the claim uh, that the cortex is the seat of consciousness because clearly she's not unconscious. But, but as I say, more interesting than that is when you place her baby brother on her lap, she goes, ah, she likes it. Uh, she reacts emotionally. So not only is she awake uh, in the sense of not being in a coma, uh, but she's also emotionally responsive. And I have to say, she's emotionally responsive in situationally appropriate ways. In other words, if you clap your hands unexpectedly, she startles, put her, your, her baby brother in her lap, she smiles, uh, tickle her, she giggles, frustrate her, she arches her back and complains. Uh, so you can have emotional responsiveness in the absence of cortex. Um, so it's not just that these kids' lights are on, there is a quality to their experience, and that quality is affect. It is emotional feeling. Um, and we've I said, known since the late 1940s, that all consciousness is contingent uh, on the reticular activating system activating uh, our, our, our cortex. Uh, we've always thought of it as a sort of power supply, a sort of on-off switch. Unless you plug the television set in at the wall, it's not going to work. It doesn't mean that television comes from the power source. It means it's a necessary prerequisite. So we've always known that brainstem arousal is a necessary prerequisite for cortical consciousness. But now what we learn from these kids is not that this prerequisite, this, this essential precondition, or any kind of consciousness at all has a quality, and that quality is called affect, in other words, emotional feeling. Um, that suggests that affect, feeling, is the foundational form of consciousness because without it, you can't have any other form of consciousness. Uh, all the other types of consciousness are contingent upon brainstem arousal, which takes the form of affect. So that's the second argument I'm presenting to you. I'm saying, we shouldn't be looking at cortex, we should be looking at the brainstem, and we shouldn't be looking at visual perception, we should be looking at affect, because affect is the elemental, foundational, most basic form of consciousness in every sense of the word. Now, the problem with um, these kids that I've just shown you, uh, and I've just shown you two examples, of course, they're hundreds, um, is that uh, my colleagues, uh, when I show them these uh, slides I've just shown you, uh, they say, well, how do you know that those children are conscious? They can't tell you what it's like to be them. So how do you know there is anything like it to be them? Um, you know, that I must say, I find quite a shocking argument because uh, it implies uh, that a, a, a baby, uh, before it's able to talk to you, isn't conscious. Uh, it implies that your pet dog or cat uh, which you have, I hope, a nice emotional relationship with, uh, and who you, you see its emotional responsivity every day, it can't tell you what it's feeling, but it shows you what it's feeling. Uh, but on the argument from these colleagues, uh, that's not good enough, yet they have to actually tell you what it, and they can't tell you, um, these kids, because they've got no cortex. So all we can do is look at other methods, and I'm gonna quickly show you some other evidence to confirm uh, that affect, feeling, raw feeling is actually generated in the brainstem. 
So one method is to show you, you take away the cortex, you still have raw feeling, and I've told you what the problem is with that. So let's try another method. Let's stimulate the reticular activating system. Um, the prediction that arises from that, uh, my theory, is that when you stimulate the, you should generate intense feelings. Uh, and you shouldn't be able to do that by stimulating the cortex. Well, stimulate the cortex, you, you don't get feelings. Uh, you get very mild, occasional uh, uh, feelings. Stimulate the reticular activating system, you get raw affect of great intensity. So I'm not going to read you this, but this, the patient that I, whose brain I just showed you a moment ago, uh, when that brainstem nucleus I showed you in the reticular activating system was stimulated, she fell into a suicidal depression uh, within five seconds. Uh, she had never been depressed before. She fell into a suicidal depression within five seconds of the electrode being switched on. And 90 seconds after it was switched off, uh, this, the suicidal depression disappeared. Now, that's just one example. I can multiply that a hundredfold. Uh, you stimulate different reticular activating brainstem nuclei, you generate intense affect. And the same applies to uh, a brainstem structure known as the periaqueductal gray or PAG. Um, there is no site in the brain in which you can elicit a wider range of affects and more intense affects than the PAG. So that method demonstrates it's consistent with the view that, that these structures actually generate feeling. Uh, in, and, and patients like this can tell us so uh, because their cortex is intact. Um, here's another method you can use, positron emission tomography. You can scan uh, the brains of people who are in intense affective states. Uh, here we have fear and anger and happiness and, uh, and uh, joy. Uh, no, what is it? I can't read what's up there. So you, you, maybe you can read it, but these are intense basic emotions. I can't remember which ones are being shown up there. One of them is rage. Um, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what the other one is. Um, and fear and, 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 and joy down here. Now, these are intensely felt by these people while they're in the scanner. Um, and uh, if the cortex was what's generating these feelings, you would see red uh, and yellow coloring in the cortex. Uh, instead, you see blue and purple, which means that they're deactivated. Um, where you see the red and yellow activation is in the brain stem. This is where these feelings are being generated. They're generated in subcortical structures in the brain stem, not in the cortex. Um, the drugs that psychiatrists dole out uh, for, uh, for depression, uh, they uh, increase a brain chemical called serotonin. Uh, for anxiety, uh, they decrease a brain chemical called noradrenaline. Uh, for psychosis, uh, they decrease a brain chemical called dopamine. These are emotional disorders. So this is another line of evidence that the chemicals uh, which we manipulate uh, to, to change the emotional state of our psychiatric patients are chemicals which are sourced in these very same nuclei that I'm talking to you about. The reticular activating system is where serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline come from. Uh, so all of the different methods that we use all lead us to the same conclusion that, that the cortex is not where feelings are generated, uh, that feelings are generated in the brain stem, and the brain stem provides the basic arousal for the whole of the rest of the brain. And therefore, I'm saying we should be focusing on this part of the brain, the part of the brain that generates consciousness uh, at its core. Uh, that's its whole function. Uh, the reticular activating system is to generate consciousness, unlike the visual cortex, uh, which can, as I've told you, uh, process visual information consciously or unconsciously. And it can only process it consciously to the extent that it is activated by the reticular activating system. So we should have been looking here. And also we shouldn't have been looking at vision at all because that can, that can go on unconsciously. Who ever heard of a feeling that goes on unconsciously? Uh, even Freud, the discoverer of the unconscious nature of much of our mental processing, even he said, you can't have a feeling uh, that isn't conscious because if it wasn't conscious, it wouldn't be a feeling. Uh, who ever heard of a feeling that you didn't feel? If you don't feel it, it ain't a feeling. So these are intrinsically conscious processes. Um, and for all of the reasons that I've been saying, I think this is where we should have been focusing our attentions. So let's focus our attentions there. Remember the questions we're asking. 
why and how does it feel like something to be an organism? Uh, and why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark? I'm saying, well, visual information processing can go on in the dark, but this kind of information processing can't go on in the dark. Uh, it is intrinsically felt. Uh, so that if we can identify the function of feelings, I think we will have identified the function of the kind that, that Chalmers said, well, you can know what the function of vision is. It's not going to tell you why it feels like something. He says there's no cognitive function such that we can say in advance that explanation of that function will automatically explain experience. But he's saying that with reference to vision. If we change this word cognitive function to affective function, uh, it no longer rings true. Uh, if, if you were to say there's no affective function such that we can say in advance that explanation of that function will automatically explain experience, I'll say that's not true. There is one, feeling. Feeling, I can say in advance that an explanation of the function of feeling will automatically explain why it feels like something because that's the function of feeling. The function of feeling is to be felt. So what is the function of feeling? This is the nub of what I'm going to say to you. Um, it's mechanism, it's functional mechanism. The thing that Chalmers says identifying the functional mechanism doesn't solve the problem. Uh, the functional mechanism of feeling is called homeostasis. Uh, we are biological creatures. Uh, we all have to remain within fixed uh, uh, physiological bounds, not only physiological bounds, uh, certain uh, 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 emotional bounds too, which I'll mention in a moment. But let's start with physiological bounds. You have to stay within the narrow temperature range uh, between 36 and a half and 37 and a half degrees Celsius. That's where you need to be uh, if you're going to stay alive. You get much hotter, you die. You get much colder, you die. The same applies to your blood pressure. The same applies to um, your blood gases. Uh, if you don't have enough oxygen uh, in your in your bloodstream, you're going to die. Uh, if, uh, if you have too much carbon dioxide in your bloodstream, you're going to die. Okay, so homeostasis is the mechanism whereby we living things stay within our within our viable ranges, our physiologically viable ranges. If you move out of that range, there's a demand on your body to do something about it, um, to perform some work to bring you back into your viable range. And that work is based in a prediction as to what needs to be done. So that, for example, if you go out of your viable blood pre pressure range, uh, then you need to change your heart rate, you need to reduce it, and you need to change the dilation of your vessels, you have to make it larger. Uh, those are the predictions your body has as to what needs to be done in order to bring you back into your viable range. Um, the same applies to uh, water, uh, you know, if you're thirsty, uh, if you if you if, uh, if you lack water, you know, then you've got to. The prediction is you've got to drink some. You know, if you're too hot, you've got to perspire, and you and you and you must breathe more rapidly. These are these are basic uh, bio, biological mechanisms whereby we stay alive by maintaining homeostasis. Now, let me take uh, that. None of those things have to be conscious. Okay, that's homeostasis, the basic. Bio. In fact, you're not aware of your blood pressure regulation. It's a clinically notorious problem that you don't know about your overshoots and undershoots. These things are run by reflexes, uh, things like perspiring and panting um, uh, uh, and so on. So let's use one example in order to show uh, how homeostasis relates to feeling. Um, there, let's take, let's take respiratory control. Uh, I told you, you have to keep your blood gases in a viable range. Uh, and, and you normally do by an autonomic reflex. There's a prediction. What you've got to do is expand the intercostal, uh, uh, the in intercostal muscles will expand your diaphragm and then it contracts again and then it expands and then it contracts. And this happens automatically all day long. And this is how you breathe and you do it unconsciously uh, until you find yourself in a situation for which you have no prediction. Here's the crucial point. Um, so imagine now you're in a carbon dioxide filled room. Suddenly at this point, uh, you move out of your viable range and your ordinary reflex doesn't help because the room's full of carb carbon dioxide. Now, what do you do? Uh, now you don't have a prediction. Instead, you have uncertainty as to what to do. Um, so you feel this, this demand for work that I mentioned earlier, um, it's felt as an unpleasant feeling uh, which we call air hunger. 
it's also called suffocation alarm or respiratory distress. The feeling intrudes onto consciousness forcibly. And please note, it's a feeling. Um, and that feeling says you've got to do something, otherwise you're going to cop it. So what do you do? You can't use a reflex. The prediction is not available. So you have to use your feeling state um, to navigate by trial and error this environment. If I go upstairs, what happens? If I go downstairs, what happens? I don't know which one to do. I've never been in a burning building before, let alone this particular one. So you try it. Uh, as they say, you suck it and see. So you, you head upwards uh, and you will quickly know by how it feels uh, whether there's more oxygen there or less. In fact, there's less. And so you feel more suffocation alarm, more respiratory distress, more air hunger. So you change your mind and you go down because you're in a state of uncertainty. You go downstairs. There you find you can breathe more easily. And so you feel the pleasurable relief, um, which tells you you are now heading back to where you need to be, uh, where you can be in this normal state of nirvana of not knowing, uh, not having these, these perturbations, uh, or these, these, these um, uh, dangers actually to your very existence. So this is what feeling is for. Uh, the, 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 the example of how you transition from auto automatic respiratory control um, to voluntary control, where you have to do something uh, that's what the feeling is for. It's for navigating uncertainty. It's, it enables us to survive in unpredicted environments. And God knows there are many of those uh, in the world. So it's an enormous adaptive advantage. So that's what feeling is for. Please note, I've only told you about one type of feeling. There are many different categories of feeling. They are qualitatively distinct from each other. So that Air hunger feels very different from thirst, feels very different from the need to urinate, feels very different from fear, uh, which is another, you know, you have to stay within your range, which is I'm not in danger. If you are in danger, you feel fear, uh, which is very different from rage. Uh, you have to stay within your viable state, which is that there are no frustrating obstacles impeding you, preventing you from getting the things you need. If they are, you feel rage. Uh, and then you've got to do something uh, in order to fix the situation. So that's what conscious feelings are for. They're for navigating uncertainty, for us to be able to feel our way through life's problems. It's a huge advance over reflexes. So this answers the question, why and how is there something it is like to be an organism, something it's like for the organism? I've told you what feelings are for. I've told you why we have them. Uh, and now, uh, by reference to the mechanism of homeostasis, I've showed you how that's achieved. Those brainstem nuclei that I showed you uh, are demonstrably homeostatic. They are the basic homeostatic regulators um, of the brain. And uh, they all send their error signals. They all converge on the periaqueductal gray, the structure that I mentioned to you, where we get the most intense and widest range of affects. Uh, the periaqueductal gray is where we select our priorities between our different needs, and then we the prioritized feelings enter consciousness, and we use them to navigate our environment. So we've answered that question. Now, this leads us to the project that we're doing, which, as I told you, I can only introduce you to. I really must stop speaking in a couple of minutes. Um, so here's the, these are the equations we're working with. We're saying that if consciousness uh, in its most elementary form, in other words, raw feelings, uh, if, they, if it can be reduced to this functional mechanism I've just described, uh, then we if that really is the causal mechanism whereby feelings are generated, then we should be able to engineer a system using this mechanism uh, in order to generate feelings artificially. Please note, they're not normal feelings, they're not human feelings, they're not biological feelings, they're artificial feelings. But we should be able to generate a, 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 an agent. We should be able to engineer an agent that has this functionality. So that's what we're doing. Uh, our agent um, has a model uh, of, of, its, uh, of itself in the world uh, of, uh, uh, on the basis of which it predicts what to do, like those reflexes I told you about. And then it acts on the world on the basis of those predictions on the outside world. And it expects certain sensory states, it predicts certain sensory consequences, like 
if I do, if I do this with my with my with my lungs, uh, then I will not experience air hunger. It will all be fine. And if that prediction is confirmed, you just carry on doing that thing. It works. But if it doesn't work, if you you then get an error signal, which is what the, which is what this is. That's what this thing here is. It's saying I'm not where I need to be, uh, and so that's an error signal, which from the point of view of the system is an existential crisis. Um, it is now registering my own imminent demise. Uh, and so what that feeling does um, is, uh, it, is it tells you you've, you've done something wrong, but what the feeling is for, is for you, and this is where the feeling is generated in the brainstem. And this is this precision term over here. I'm not, I don't have time to go into all of this. I'm happy to discuss it in, the, uh, uh, in, our, in our Q and A after this. So. Um, if you if you're in a state of error, then you have to do something different. In other words, you have to update your predictive model. Your predictive model that tells you what to do didn't work, and so you've got to learn something new. And so these error signals are used to update the predictive model. And then next time you can, the next time you're in a burning building, you know, don't go upstairs, go downstairs. That's where the oxygen is. So through feeling our way through life's problems, we also learn from experience. Um, what to do uh, in what was previously an, a novel situation, and now it becomes predictable, a predictable situation. This is called the law of affect. You learn through what feels bad and what feels good, what to do. The role of precision is to modulate the confidence that you have, the statistical uh, confidence, uh, which, which, uh, which we call precision, um, how, how precise uh, your, your, your distribution is. Uh, the, the feelings modulate your precision in the error signal over, uh, over your prediction. In other words, how confident am I in what I'm busy doing now? Uh, is this going to save my bacon? Uh, as the precision, in other words, the statistical confidence in that prediction goes down, which means it's going up in the error signal, it means it feels bad. I mean, that's just the nub of the issue. That if things are going as expected, that's good for the organism. Uh, if things are, if uncertainty prevails, that's bad. Uh, it predicts your demise. So this is how feeling works. Remember, it works across multiple categorical variables. We have multiple different needs. And so there's a qualitatively distinct flavor or color to each one of these feeling states. Uh, and this, and they have to be categorical variables because you have to meet each one of them in their own right. You can't just reduce them to a common denominator called need. Um, there's qualitatively distinct needs. That's what feelings are. So uh, why is all of this accompanied by experience? Why doesn't all of this go on in the dark? Well, because in the dark, there are no feelings. Uh, feelings which are intrinsically evaluative, intrinsically qualitative, intrinsically subjective uh, states, uh, which are, which are, when I say intrinsically subjective, I mean they're registered by the organism, for the organism, they matter to the organism, because they announce, they register, they broadcast to us um, the most profound value system uh, of all living things, which is that it's good to die. I mean, good to live and bad to die. Good to survive, bad to die. And feelings are how uh, we uh, how we enact, uh, how we how we how we how we comply with, uh, 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 how we fit our lives into this basic value system. Um, and it's how voluntary behavior becomes possible uh, and, and which enables us to survive in uncertain situations. Now, look, all of that's just a clue, okay, as to the direction that we should go in. We're busy trying to implement it in our artificial uh, 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 agent uh, that I told you about at the beginning. Um, and as we do it, we're fleshing out lots of details um, about, about um, uh, uh, the complexities of making a system that functions this way. The point is simply uh, that uh, this function is the function of consciousness. It's an intrinsically uh, 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 felt uh, 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 form of consciousness. Uh, the, the, it has to be felt. Uh, this is how it's what it does. This is what its functionality is. Uh, so we we think uh, we're on a different path, um, and we're making very interesting progress. Uh, for more uh, details uh, of what I've just said to you, here's the book that Ralph mentioned earlier. So I'll stop there, and we've got about twenty minutes for questions. Sorry, I've gone on. I've gone on a long time, uh, a little bit longer than I planned. But come on, it's a complicated topic. Thanks very much.
Thanks, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, and no problem. That was uh, that was great. Um, I'm going to see what uh, what uh, people have to say, have to say in the room. Um, just as one jumping off point from me, I noticed I picked up on the phrase you used just there a few sentences back of you were going to flesh out the details, and I wanted to ask: Will your artificial consciousness have a body, and to what extent is this possible without? having a body uh, in terms of affect and, and consciousness? So um, what we've done so far, although we have two roboticists in our team, because we do intend to embody our, our artificial uh, uh, creature, it's uh, currently we're working with a virtual agent. In other words, we are developing the, soft we're developing the algorithms and implementing them in software. Uh, to, and the, the organism that, it, or the, 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 the uh, uh, artificial creature that is being controlled by uh, the, 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 this um, functional mechanism that we are developing uh, is, is a creature which exists only uh, on a video screen. It moves around on a video screen. But it's crucially important to recognize, first of all, I mean, why are we doing it that way? It's because we've, we've developed generation after generation of this thing. You know, you can't, ma you can't make a physical version of each one of them. Uh, so we're busy, we're busy trying to find one that has the functionality that we need through, uh, partly through what's called genetic algorithms. In other words, you develop just to, as it does over evolutionary time, uh, you know, each time that the, that the system expires, uh, uh, ceases to exist as a system. Uh, so uh, the next generation learns from that and the next generation learns and the next generation learns. And so over ge multiple generations of these virtual agents, uh, we are developing the the algorithms, um, the the, fu the functionality that we're looking for. But it's 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 more it's more than that. Uh, I I have to uh, emphasize that you and I are living in a world which is just represented to us. Okay, you you're actually living in a world where all that you're receiving uh, is 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 neurons firing or not firing. In other words, ones or zeros. It's all that you're actually registering in your brain. From that, uh, you create this virtual representation of what's going on out there. The color doesn't exist in the world, for example. You know, it does, there's no such thing as color. What there are is wavelengths of light, uh, which then, which then uh, are transduced into nerve impulses, which, as I say, are just bits of information, ones or zeros, uh, spike drains. Uh, and then from that, you imbue the world uh, with these qualities. Uh, you paint the world by numbers, as it were. Uh, so we're all living in in a manner of speaking in a virtual reality. We don't know what's beyond there, but you know we have faith that there is something beyond there that's actually being represented uh, in the form of my perception. So it's not it's not such a radically uh, different situation that our agent is in. It's performing the actual calculations which actually control uh, its representation of itself uh, and its body. Um, so that's the way we're working so far. We are going to embody it. Uh, it that's our, the next step of what we're going to do uh, because uh, it makes a difference uh, to, to, to embody uh, an agent. There are all sorts of problems that arise uh, with embodiment, uh, but also to be absolutely honest with you, because of prejudice, uh, nobody is going to believe uh, that an agent which doesn't exist in a three-dimensional physical body uh, could possibly have consciousness. Uh, although I have to say, uh, scientifically, that doesn't make sense. So well, one of the experiments we're going to do uh, is we're also going to, uh, before we move to the embodied creature, we're going to get um, uh, judges uh, in, in, in a sort of a version of the Turing test, uh, where we're going to show them uh, a, a human, uh, a, 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 that we're saying you can't see the person or, or the agent that's behind this. Uh, we want you to just judge by its behavior, by how it makes decisions and choices in conditions of uncertainty as to how to go about meeting its needs in a changing, unpredictable environment. Um, we're, going to we're going to do see how judges uh, uh, rate it, in other words, believe that it has feelings or doesn't have feelings, when it's a human form, uh, when it's an a, 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 a animal form, uh, and whether it's a, 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 an artificial form, which at least looks humanoid, uh, as opposed to a completely, a, a completely uh, 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 abstract geometric shape on a screen. Uh, 
um, and we want to see how much does just the way it looks, uh, how much does that influence our, our judges' ratings um, as one way of measuring to what extent are we just dealing with prejudice here. Um, but as I say, we are going to embody um, our agent uh, it, 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 as the next step. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. Yeah, it's one of the things that struck me in your book is how much work we do to actually impose our perceptions onto the world rather than take those perceptions in from the world. And I know that I have a couple of friends here who are very into virtual reality. They're virtual reality uh, practitioners. And um, I think what you said just now about you know, highlighting the virtual nature of our own existence I'm sure res resonates with them. I also thought at the beginning when you were talking about the, that famous essay about what is it like to be a bat, um, I, I wondered if some of my friends in here were thinking about, let's do it in VR and we'll show you what it's like to, 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 be, a, to be a bat. Um, so I don't know if either, uh, I, I'm not seeing hands and anybody's welcome to put up hands, but um, I don't know if either uh, Jason, if you, would, if you would be interested in, in saying something, Jason Stapleton is one of the VR While we're waiting for Jason or whoever else wants to speak, yeah. uh, David Chalmers' most recent book, uh, the philosopher I mentioned uh, who coined the term the hard problem uh, is on, on virtual reality. The book is called Reality Plus. Hmm. And he makes the point, you know, that, that you've just made and that I made in the manner of speaking, you know, that we are living in a virtual uh, world. Um, but we have, I want to emphasize that we have faith that there is something behind uh, the, 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 the representations that we are capable of generating. And uh, the year again, it comes, it comes back to homeostasis. Uh, the fact of the matter is in the end, you have real needs. Uh, and if you don't meet those needs, really, you're going to die. And uh, that's, that's what applies to our artificial agent, even in its virtual state. Uh, it, it ceases to exist if it doesn't meet its needs. Uh, it's no longer exists as a system and, it, and, and, and it's gone. You know, so, so it's crucial that we must, th this thing about the needs of the system, of a self-organizing system uh, it, to, to, to remain within its viable bounds, uh, to maintain its structural and functional integrity. Those are not virtual um, uh, 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 because they really do uh, expire uh, if those needs are not really met. Thank you, thank you. So anybody in the audience, um, you'll notice that there is a screen. I guess there's Jason, he's got his hand up. I'm gonna ask you, to unmute. Are you unmuted, Jason? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, right. Are, are yeah. you uh, are you viewable or are you keeping your uh, oh, video? Uh, I'm not sure if I am. I've just set up on my new computer here, so I'm not sure even if my uh, if yeah, you... detects it. Yeah, sorry. I've literally just got this new computer last last night. In, no anyway, um, you can do it audio, audio I, I, I just wanted to say something in my, my experience in, in VR social, so VR social specifically being um, hang, hanging out in virtual reality in a social con con context, um, it's, it's very, very strange and I, I, won't, I won't go into a long deep description, but ult ultimately the only feeling that I could equate it to was something, something similar to a, a dream. So the the sort of logic that goes with the dreamscape. So I'm talking about walking around in a place where everyone looks like a cat or a dog or a robot or a snake or my one friend shows up as a cable tie sliding around on the floor. Um, it's utterly strange. And what is strange to me is how quickly we a, a, adapt, right? So you, you go into this place, it's my in, intuition is it should be in highly un an uncomf uncomfortable feeling, feel, feel, something close to ma madness. Um, and that you, <laughs> there's this, you, uh, your, there's no pre premise for your brain to be able to deal with something even close to, to this in, in vir virtual reality. Instead, you get used to it really, really quick. Um, and to me, that it feels like a, a dream. Yeah, that's that. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. I, I, I think uh, I know this is not the sense in which you're using the word or referring to the phenomenon, but the fact that we do have dreams, all of us, uh, shows the how, how the extent to which and with the granular detail within which um, uh, and the convincing nature of uh, our dream experiences, uh, which are uh, by definition virtual. 
So we're experiencing a very detailed uh, uh, reality, which feels absolutely convincingly real uh, every night while we sleep. And that shows you that, that our brains have this functionality for generating realities. Uh, in the case of dreams, there's no perception behind those realities that they're, they're generated from long-term memory. Um, but uh, it, it, it demonstrates the basic point uh, that we were making earlier, that actually all the time we're living in a virtual reality, something that our brain is generating. Um, but more to the point uh, that you were making, uh, yes, it's amazing uh, how rapidly we adjust to this new representation of reality. Um, and in my own field, uh, we, we, we have um, examples of that too. Uh, I don't know if you know the rubber hand illusion. It's very easy to persuade somebody that a rubber hand is actually their own hand. Uh, you cover their own hand um, and next to it, you place the rubber hand, which they know is a rubber hand. And then you stroke their own hand and the rubber hand at the same time. Uh, and and the, the rhythmical stroking of their own hand under the screen, uh, in which they can't see, and then they do see the rhythmical stroking of the rubber hand, it makes them feel as if the rubber hand is theirs. Uh, and, and so they just, even though they know it's not true, they feel it to be true. There's an even more dramatic um, a, a thing called the body swap illusion, where you have a camera uh, on the head of one person and a VR goggles uh, on the face of another person and they're facing each other so that the person with the goggles is seeing themselves from the point of view of the other person uh, who has the camera on their heads. So they feel themselves to be interacting with the body, which is their own body. Uh, and they very rapidly uh, adjust to that and say, yeah, that guy out there is Mark Solms. I know that's me, but it doesn't feel like me. I feel as if I'm this person. And even when you shake hands uh, with your confederate, you feel as if you're shaking an object out there's hands called Mark Solms. And most telling of all, when you take a knife and threaten uh, the Mark Solms that, that they're seeing, you, they don't have uh, the same startle response that they do if the knife is pointed towards the person who's got the camera on their heads, which isn't actually you, but it feels like you. And the objective evidence of that is that you have the galvanic skin response um, uh, and, and, and a heart rate uh, change, um, uh, uh, these objective signs of a startle response, uh, you have it when the, when the blade is actually directed towards somebody who's not you, but you've now swapped the body with. So those kinds of things are shockingly easily manipulated um, in, in the human mind. Yeah, you, you would be um, sur surprised at how quick you learn to feel like a cat <laughs> in, <Yes. laughs> in virtual reality. There's, there's, there's yeah. all sorts of strange things that happen. Happen. There's yeah. a, people coming up to you and pat, patting you on the uh, head becomes a normal thing. Um, and a, a, again, I'm just it's it's how fast people get used used to that and how quick quickly it doesn't seem utterly strange is is strange. Yes, thank you, mm. yeah. thank you, Jason. I know that. Uh, I know that Jason is keen to get you into uh, VR sometime, uh, Mark. So we'll yeah, I'd we'll be very, I'd be very glad to meet with you and chat with you because, as I as I told you, we're we're one of the things that we're trying to do is this thing um, where we where we judge the prejudice of our raters, and uh, 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 working right. with you would be would be very handy um, in that respect. I need to Fantastic. emphasize one last time, though, because it cuts cut, cuts to the part of what I, uh, what I think we're talking about, that these external representations of ourselves as avatars, which is actually even in the lived reality that we're in right now, uh, is what they are, virtual representations of ourselves. Um, they are not the same thing as our feelings. Our feelings uh, are ours. And, that, and, and they have, uh, 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 despite the bad press that feelings have got over the centuries, uh, they're actually a more direct, empirically direct representation of your own uh, being in, in, in the sense of uh, your, own, your own subjective existence in the sense that Nagel was talking about than do these external bodily forms. Thank you. I, I, Thank I, I feel that, uh, sorry, sorry, Rolf. I, I feel that um, VR is, is a tool by which we can test, test this and, and put a fine point on it. For instance, I've had experiences where, where, where my, my perception of the real world is slightly changed by my experience in, virt in virtual reality. So there's like this bleed, bleed over from virtual reality back into the, uh, real, the, the real world. Yeah.
Thank you. I'm, I'm going to seriously ask Ralph to put us in touch with each other. Yeah, please do. Great. Please do. Yes, yeah, that would be great. Well, I will yeah. for sure. Me and Jason do quite a lot of uh, virtual reality artwork together. Um, and then I see a, a question and comment from Jim Harrington. And um, I'm going to ask Jim if you would like to ask it verbally and just to frame uh, Jim as my yoga teacher and a very esteemed yoga practitioner. And I think it's an interesting uh, perhaps other frame because you know you talk about having a yoga practice and yoga is very much about the practice of the body and the mind so I think it may be related to that you can know what the neural networks are that, are, that make sight but it's different from seeing so um, Jim if you I've asked you to unmute if you do feel like asking that verbally please do uh, yeah <clears throat> thanks Ralph uh, Mark just, just really uh, a couple of sort of threads that uh, popped up for me while I was listening to the presentation. And um, um, there's, there's a, a whole sort of field of uh, inquiry, which is coming from, a, I mean, an, a very traditional uh, perspective in, in uh, the yoga tradition. And this is, I'm talking about things that were written down maybe a thousand, five hundred years ago, where they asked questions such as um, what popped to mind was something from the Upanishads, where the, the, it's philosophy, basically, where they said, what is the, what is the ear of the ear? And another line was, what is the eye of the eye? And another line was, what is the mind of the mind? And this is people who are just really trying to inquire, what is this? thing that's experiencing so yeah no, it's the... more a, more just a comment really that a... yes. well that's that's an ancient uh, an ancient version of what's now called the homuncular problem uh, and the infinite regress you know right. the idea the idea that there's a little person inside of you seeing a little person inside of you seeing a little person inside of you uh, that, yeah. that's at least what it suggests to me the infinite regress of the idea of there being a Cartesian theater in the, in the head. Uh, yeah, it sounds also like you're asking what, um, it does sound like it's about consciousness. What is, uh, how, how is the ear aware of itself as an ear or the mind aware of itself as a mind? Yeah. So, so my answer to the homuncular problem um, uh, and uh, which all of it has to do with extra reception um, is that the thing the, the, the grounding self uh, that's actually doing all of the all of the experiencing uh, is uh, is the is the feeling being I believe that a sentient subject is literally constituted by feelings and then you feel your way into your cognitive representations including your perceptual representations remembering that they are in themselves are unconscious uh, information processing uh, and 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 you feel your way into that information processing um, in order to palpate um, your uncertainties, uh, to put it in an in a, in a overly abstract uh, a way. But the point of the matter is that the grounding um, as, as, uh, uh, actual sentient subject is a, is a feeling subject. Uh, and these extraceptive representations are, uh, are, are not you. You are yeah. what feels your way into them. Yeah, very interesting. And then, then what is the role of the sense of I? Because you can, uh, this is also a traditional view of like, there's a thing called the sense of I, the I maker. And, and, um, you know, and it's said to be not the actual consciousness, but there's the consciousness and then there's the, the thing that says I am I based yeah, on so the, yeah. Relationship so trans, trans, uh, sorry, I, I, I overspoke but, there. What was the last uh, thing you said? So, uh, so, the, so the, the eye maker, it's called the ahamkara. And that is the thing that sort of, um, they say, mistakes us. Uh, we, we make the mistake of thinking that the, the consciousness is I. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit too. Uh, yeah, um, uh, it, I mean, it is. It is okay. outside of my ken uh, what yeah, you're yeah. talking about. So I might not be understanding the issues. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, it's uh, because they are obviously profound issues, which which behind mm. which there is a very 
a deep tradition. But, yeah. but I will just say that in, in, from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, um, the, I think that we make a mistake. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm saying the opposite of what you just said, but maybe not. Uh, but I think we make a mistake to think that our idea of ourselves, in other words, our reflective awareness uh, that I am an object having these uh, subjective experiences, uh, that, that's a, 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 a cognitive representation of a thing called yes. me, um, is not the same thing as raw feeling. So, right. so if you think about those kids that I showed you on the slides, who have mm. no cortex and therefore absolutely no possibility of representing themselves as objects mm. in their minds uh, and giving them a name and saying, that's me, in other words, reflectively uh, objectifying their own, uh, their own subjective existence. They have only subjective existence, only in the form of raw feelings. And mm. I would say that there is a subject there, there's a sentient subject there, but it will never call itself I. Uh, so it doesn't know what subjectivity is but nevertheless, it has it. Um, you know, it's like it, perhaps to try and translate it into our own experience. You know, uh, to feel pain is just to feel pain. You know, you don't have to call it pain. Uh, you, you, you don't have to understand anything about pain. You don't even need to know where the pain came from. It's just a feeling, and the just having of that feeling um, is to is to is to exist. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's like a a translation, uh, um, if you forgive me for saying something so crass, uh, of, uh, of Descartes, uh, uh, I think, therefore I am. I, I think it's a mistake. I think it's more that I feel, therefore I am. Um, and I don't even have to state it in words. As long as you feel, you are. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Jim. And yeah, just to reflect you maybe a little of what Jim had said is that I've got some experience of meditation, like mindfulness meditation, and, and just enough to feel like I've got a taste of what it proposes, which is it says, I am not my thoughts and I am not my feelings. I am something else. And when you meditate, you cultivate that part of yourself, which otherwise escapes you constantly because you're constantly in your thoughts and in your feelings. And if you practice meditation, you start to cultivate some kind of really felt but mysterious place in which you are not either of those things. And I think that's what's very attractive. Great. Thank you. So are we at the end of our time? We are. We are. Yeah. And uh, Mark, thank you very much for, for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks to the people who've uh, engaged. Thanks to my colleagues. Um, thanks to Humor for hosting this. And we are at the end of um, another attire seminar, and we'll be back uh, next week. So thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, pleasure, Mark. We'll catch up soon. <laughs>